back to another mutiny. It's me, Cory, the voice of Zaba Otrov, a real good guy. I'm gathered by a real special pe group of people this time. Introduce yourselves. We will, but only after you introduce your other voices. Oh, I also play, uh, you know, I also play Rizzerk, and I also play Volmo. Well, played them. They're both dead now, but you know that if you're listening to this, I imagine. If not, I apologize for the spoiler, but whoops, I'm bad at keeping things alive. I am I'm, Rachel. I, I play only Sil. I talked over you. Now you talk. <laughs> uh, I'm Jackson. I play Vesuviac the Molten. I'm Robin and I do stuff. <laughs> I'm back. Yep. That's right. We've managed to drag Robin along for another joyous ride through uh, whatever strange topics we decide to digress Kicking to and screaming, today. Mind you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There was, there was arguments. There was the drinking of really strong liquors in the form of absinthe and meads. You know, we've we've really had. Yeah. You know, I just spent ten thousand gold to Espionage. ensure. That, that Wobbin was here. <laughs> Just so that we could talk about fun topics. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit uh, zany. And that's because I want to talk about weird characters in particular. Because I realize all of us have played something weird and off the walls. We kind of talked about it on our previous mutiny. But let's get into the meat of the potatoes. Because that's not how that saying goes. But I prefer it that way. I actually thought that's how that saying went up until like, what, a year ago when I said it to, I believe, Robin and they corrected me and I looked it up and discovered that it's not the meat of the potatoes and I had been saying it wrong my whole what life. What did you think that the meat of the potatoes would mean? The meat <laughs> of the potatoes, you know, the good part, not the skin, the insides, the meat of the potato. <laughs> Gotta love that potato meat. You know, it's like... It's like the inside of papaya is the, the meat of, like, the the, the meat flesh. of the papaya. Yeah. yeah. I laughed flesh myself meat. into wheezing tears, and he had no idea why. And I just, I had to explain. I was like, that is not how you say that. So it turns out I was wrong. <laughs> Other things I've discovered that you guys don't necessarily say down in the States... I'm not going to say that the meat of the potatoes is said anywhere except for from my mouth. <laughs> I come from a small prairie town, so we had some fun <laughs> euphemisms. Well, that's a Saskatchewan thing. Hoodies are not hoodies. We call them bunny hugs where I'm from. Bunny hugs? Bunny like hug. hug? Oh, that's so yeah, much like better. A, a what bunny the hug. fuck? It's yeah. very cute. So that's the category for any pullover sweater with a pocket on the front and a hood. Zip up ones don't count. That's a hoodie. But anything that has the pouch on the front and a hood is a bunny hut. It's a well known thing in Saskatchewan. It's a weird little turn of phrase, I guess. Uh, another thing that we say where I come from that it turns out they don't say everywhere and you get weird looks is when you're not doing much of anything where I come from, you say that you're fucking the dog. Apparently, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's not a common saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish everyone could see your face right now it's just a normal thing where i come from so you know what sometimes i say weird things and i mean nothing by it but weird redneck farmers say strange things like fucking the dog to describe taking your time being lazy not really getting anything pussy done. yeah pussy footing you're fucking the dog So, you equate those oh two God. things is such a wild fucking thing. <laughs> the more you know about me. I, oh. I missed a lot of these early mutinies, so people probably got used to a certain level of professionality and straightforwardness, but I'm not I got very good a lot at that. Of, I got a lot of playing grab ass, is what, what everyone called it. Mm, or I've just fucking off. Yeah, playing grab ass, fucking off. I've heard both of them, but fucking the dog has a special, special oomph no, to it, doesn't no, it? Just stop <laughs> it. <laughs> no, not you, Romeo. Go lay down. 
I'm kidding. He, <laughs> he is turn. definitely sleeping on my bed. So let's talk about weird characters now that we've had that <laughs> fun little break. <laughs> I play weird characters all the time. I don't think anybody I play is grounded completely in reality. Or at least if they are, it's their own separate reality that's kind of adjacent from the rest. What's your favorite weird character you've played? My favorite weird character isn't actually weird. They were just a halfling thief. But they were played in, as I said in the last mutiny, we play, I played a lot of very loose interpretation of D&D. The best example of which was... The person who I joined D&D with ran a campaign in a coffee shop. We just met up, whoever was there, played, you know, high school years, so just random every time. And they just made everything up every time. And so the character I played, uh, their thing was they had a necklace full of magic rings. Uh, but I think this is still true in Pathfinder. You can only use two at once, yeah, in Pathfinder? Okay. Correct. With Unless you get an item called a Hand of Glory, which allows you to equip an extra ring. Okay. So, yeah. so And that's been true since, you know, AD and D1, which is what I'm talking about. So, they had a whole necklace of rings, and they would just randomly do different combinations. Their favorite combination was Invisibility and Feather Fall. So, they would climb up to the top of roofs, and then get everyone's attention and then jump off the roof and go invisible and, you know, not die. Um, but they just, they just like to do random things like that. Water breathing and water walking was another common one. So they just walk around on water with their head underwater. Um, so yeah, not weird in creation, just kind of a weirdo. Uh, sometimes those are the most fun. I briefly played in, I believe it was three sessions, uh, a one-shot. Uh, I played an Aarakocra Ranger that I spent all of their spell slots on jump. And with the Aarakocra, they can't fly, but they can glide. So they didn't walk anywhere. They jumped and glided everywhere. And that's how they moved. And they were a weirdo. They also had favorite enemy halfling. And yeah, we're... Uh, I'm glad that I can't remember their name because they're not somebody that ever needs to be played again. But they were weird, just in the sense that they moved weird. They weren't a big snake, but speaking of the Hand of Glory, if you put one of those on your animal companions, such as a snake that has no arms, it allows you to equip rings onto your snake's animal companion. Pro tip. But how would we know that? that Maybe happened. I've done it. <laughs> yeah? Yep. To a certain someone's familiar? Yeah, it's not my familiar. Why would I be worried about hurting it? God damn. Niobe is a weird character. <laughs> Niobe we is my favorite weird we character. We briefly talked about Niobe being a weird character. But can we get more into the snake lady? Oh my god. If you want to... Let's so, start at the beginning. Alex, I, 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 originally when we played Strange Aeons, Alex asked me what I wanted to be, and I said, "Oh, I want to be a Tiefling Bard." I did not, I did not play a Tiefling Bard. I started to make one, but Alex was like, "Oh, you're gonna play a Tiefling? I want to roll on my random Tiefling sheet for all of the aesthetics and you know things that." your tiefling has and I'm like okay cool go for it we rolled that my tiefling has dragon horns that she has a smell she just smells bad for her like and we rolled for each thing for her arms for her legs so her arms have an extra elbow so she looks like a pr like she has praying mantis joints her arms bend in, in an extra joint it's weird uh, but it gives her a bonus to her athletics which is neat or, no, is it athletics or acrobatics? I think it's acrobatics. I can't remember. But then she also has no ears. So she has Sonic Resistance 5. One of her traits is she can talk to bugs like insects and vermin. And it sounds a bit like beatboxing. <laughs> and uh, we, for her legs, we rolled player's choice. And then for her tail, we, we rolled aquatic. 
So I asked Alex, I was like, hey, how about since we rolled that she has an aquatic tail and we rolled choice legs, can I give her an aquatic snake body? Like waist down, she's serpent. And he goes, yeah, sure. I was like, cool. I'm not playing a bard anymore. I'm playing a druid and I'm a serpent shaman. And he goes, okay. So That's honestly the coolest yes. hell character design. <laughs> so Niobe is half like tiefling like creature and then half aquatic snake. Which he worked into her backstory as she's been essentially she was taken by Yig and the reason she's aquatic and can like breathe underwater for however long she can and like swim and everything she has an aquatic tail is because she used to be a priestess of Dagon but because Yig turned her into a snake for essentially being like no I don't want to worship you when Yig's followers were sacking her town they killed her husband and everything so like she was like I hate snakes and he was like well now you gotta be one and then Dagon was like oh this is a terrible life let me help you so gave her back some of her aquatic abilities that he had blessed her with before so she's essentially being fought over by these two gods demigods, gods, whatever they are and Niobe is a strange thing so one of the one of my favorite things about her is that like i said in the last episode alex let me give her swallow whole as an ability because she's a serpent shaman druid so she uses her wild shape to take aspect of the snake so i can swallow any creature that is a size smaller than me and below and then our friend Chris, he likes to use his wizard to enlarge me so I can eat people. Whole people. Humanoids. So she's been a blast. She gets like bonuses to CMB. I took Dangerous Tail so she can use her tail in combat. And then I took um, one of her other recent feats that I just gave her was uh, Death Roll. So I can, like, bite an enemy and just roll fiercely on the ground. <laughs> Turn into an alligator or a crocodile. Yeah, like, nice. I, I have just made her, like, the weirdest, strangest creature in existence. But yeah, I, I love her very much. And I like to play her off as she thinks she's superior because she isn't bipedal. <laughs> So she's just like this weird, creepy monstrosity. She also has a collar, a pink collar that says Niobe. Um, because in a character's backstory, she was discovered and made to be someone's creature. To scare townsfolk. <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Niobe she in her is... half human form when she was collared, or full snake form? Half and half. Okay. Like, that's her natural state. She was discovered, and they were just like, oh, you're you're a pitiful thing. You're gonna do my bidding now, essentially. In Strange Aeons, there's a lot of weird backstory stuff that's happened, and the characters are... Niobe's chaotic evil. <laughs> At this point, yeah. Yeah. I, uh... I believe that Eileen, the character I play, my alchemist that I like to mention every once in a while, I brought them over from Jade Region. By yep. doing so, I also rolled on the same charts. So Eileen went through quite a change in body shape and various traits uh, in the sense that they stopped being able to fly, they lost their wings, gained an oversized mouth and become became mummified so they no longer sleep or are immune to poisons and diseases. So, Strange Aeons at high level has definitely given us some options to make very weird characters. And it's it's very interesting. And I'm actually going to take this time to just give Alex a shout out. Congratulations. By the time this comes out, you'll know why. So. That's ominous Rachel. Fuck. Yeah, that's super <laughs> ominous. 
Oh, no, it is. it's not but ominous it's, at all. It's it's, it's all it's, in it's, good. It's a good thing. Yeah, it's okay. a good thing. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pure love for for the one and only Alex Alex G. Alex Giordano. Hell yeah. Yep. He's been Gildongo. featured on a few of our uh, our uh, dubious knowledges, so oh, sure. people know who we're talking much. about. Yeah. Yeah. He is a uh, he is a lore guy. He knows the world of Pathfinder and its zany gods, especially the dark ones, quite well. He's also just. Uh, the most chaotic human in the best way. <laughs> yeah. He's probably had some weird characters. Um, oh, yeah. What about you, Jackson? Oh, Have you ever boy. made a real weirdo? I've made several. So What's the your one favorite? that has lasted the longest. Ooh. I have found that whenever I am given clearance to play a gnome, all bets are off. I go fucking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so the first, uh, the first gnome I ever made for any significant purpose was uh, Balantio Kira. He was a divination wizard uh, and also a former member of the Cult of the Dragon as we were going through the <laughs> Tyranny of Dragons campaign. And he was just like... Like, everybody would go off and do... Like, try and come up with a battle strategy and I come in like, oh yeah, we should absolutely have the catapults to face this way so that way we can take out the dragons and then that way we can win. <laughs> I used a ninth level magic missile on Tiamat. <laughs> so he, hey, he was... It doesn't miss. It doesn't miss. It doesn't... And they have not resisted the force damage, so hey, it worked. <laughs> but he was probably one of the more long-lasting out-of-pocket characters that I've ever done. I've also made a gnome named Craig who had a list. <laughs> and the way that Craig's list worked in this universe is that um, every single person he would meet, he'd go up to and be like, hey, can you sign my list, please? I'm making it like a compendium of everybody that I meet so I don't forget anybody. And depending on their reaction to how that how that was received, it ultimately would reflect on how this character would decide their fate. They were a lawful evil character. <laughs> so if someone was like happily signed the list, they were his best friend. If someone either refused to sign the list or were like a big dick about it, didn't want to sign the list, was actively uh, going against him about it, he would get hunted down. <laughs> Jeez. So, Craig was one of the more fun ones that I've done. And then, because uh, I end up finding myself in the role of the GM uh, a lot of times, the most recent crazy NPC that I've made is another gnome. <laughs> named uh, Crystal, Spring, Crystal Spring Fizzle Spank. Uh, and he was a uh, crystal smith who would, like, shape crystals that were around this area into weaponry and, like, golems and stuff. But he was <laughs> he was another just like, well, thank you, you uh, save me from all the moon cultists, guys, because otherwise my, go my goose sure would be cooked. We want a magic sword that shoots light. <laughs> What a magic sword, sword that shoots lightning. Honestly, that, yeah. that magic weapon is one of my more favorite creations that I've made. It was a sword made of crystal, or a weapon with a blade that is made of crystal. And if you held it up into the light, it would shoot a beam that would do 1d6 damage of either... Uh, I think it was like fire, lightning, acid, poison... A, f a couple other things, but it, it, it was Roy G. Biv. It was what I was basing those on, and so when you held it up, you could choose whatever color the damage would be, and then 1d6 fire damage would happen to whatever enemy you were fighting. Cool. Like the rainbow a sword. smite, sort of. A little bit. Yeah. I, it honestly was kind well, of inspired a little bit by the Skyward Strike from Zelda Skyward Sword. That's fair. Okay. So, as somebody that's a little bit newer to the Paizo universe... That's a weapon that would be easily created within Pathfinder 1st Edition. Ooh. Right down to being made out of crystal. 
Crystal has its own weapon properties in first edition. Um, I made... This is actually one of my favorite weird characters I played. I made a barbarian fighter paladin at 11th level that was decked out in heavy plate and carried an extra large crystal blood seeking plus three great sword and essentially I spent this entire character's wealth on like 12,000 gold armor and then like 85,000 gold on making this weapon around the properties that I could channel my energy into it and essentially used range smites much as you describe so it's cool this weapon you talk about is something that could be made uh, just in a regular game of first edition with enough money I like it why not? We should all have rainbow great swords. Hell yeah. Oh yeah, totally. I'm a big fan of like sides. So the character that I mentioned before that I just recently retired, Gala, she had a she had a scythe, but in 5e there's not technically scythe rules. You use halberd rules. So it had like 10 foot reach and you know, blah blah blah, whatever halberd, halberd rules were. But we picked up this, like, we picked up this goblin in our party that we were helping do some things for, like, water deep or something. And this goblin was just like, oh, yeah, by the way, I can enchant your weapons. So if you'd like your weapon turned into a magic weapon, you know, I can do that for you over a period of time. So I had my scythe turned into a magic weapon, and I flavored it, and it was called the Grim Rose. So it was a scythe, and it was, like, wreathed in rose vines. It had- it in- my DM, my friend Dante, he scaled our items. So as we leveled, they got stronger, too. And my scythe currently was sitting at, like, 15 foot reach, and, uh... It crit on like a 19 to 20 and I could use it to like sweep attack, but it was uh, it was a really cool thing. Sounds cool. I didn't cool. get to see what else it could do. Uh, we didn't get to level it that far, but... Well, and I think that's something that's pretty interesting about us using the monster part system that we may see more of down the road. Um, as we gather more and start uh, unlocking some of those higher level imbuements is the ability to make something simple into something uh, far more versatile and capable of in Zabo's case, hopefully killing things quickly um, so we can resort to killing other things quickly I'm really excited to dive into the runes system too the runes? yeah, those seem awesome you just mean the standard system? Yeah, just, runes. just runes in general. Yeah. Like, that's something that's very new to me. I, I, I'm still a very much a Pathfinder newbie. I'm getting ready to run my first game ever of Pathfinder here in a couple weeks. Ooh, good luck. Thank you. I'm going to need it. Uh, It'll I'm, be fine. I'm at least happy that in terms of the lore and setting, we're playing on my home turf and we're playing in the RuneScape. So, <laughs> oh god, that seems fun. Yeah, so. you're, it's gonna feel a lot worse at first, but if you're playing with people you're comfortable with, you're gonna have a good time. Yeah, and, and I'm also very fortunate too, where one of my players is someone who's actually experienced with Pathfinder as well. So, oh yeah, uh, that that's gonna be a massive fucking help. That always they makes could... me feel better because I bug them for help. I'm like, look, if you're gonna play in my game, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you questions. Yeah. <laughs> It's double-edged, though, because sometimes... I mean, it's nice to have that resource. I definitely ask Jason questions when I'm running him, but... And now I'm not talking about Jason. But sometimes you get a little bit... They try to overrule you, and well, that's not how the rules work. And, uh, yeah, but you know what I say to that? 
Who's the DM? Me. Get mm -hmm. over it. There is, in fact, a rule <laughs> in the book that now. says the GM has the final say. So. Yeah. Is that still in there? Okay, nice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I haven't read the rule book. It's, it's, I don't like to read rules. It's in big, I just absorb text them. away from any of the smaller text. So, like, it's very obvious GM Reading has the final doesn't say. doesn't do anything. I have to learn them as I play because otherwise mm -hmm. I'll just sit there and stare at the book and be like, it's like so studying for a quiz at school. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> They're cool I've, to flip through. I've genuinely yeah. thought about, like, seeing if someone has, like, a Pathfinder rule quiz online where you it <laughs> asks you mechanic questions and gives you multiple choice answers. They and have you... that for fourth ed D&D. &D. Or they used to if you wanted to run sanctioned events. <laughs> I had a good time in that edition, but like, mostly for A lot the of people. people did. I'm just yeah. kidding. Like, I guess no, but you had to take a quiz online to run events that would count towards whatever the thing was that I was playing that I don't so, know the name of because was it like yeah. Adventurers League or something? Yeah, oh, man. something. Don't get okay. me started on Adventurers League. So <laughs> it could be possible for that route you're looking, just thinking. Um, there is also Pathfinder Society. So I know that there are certain qualifications that they want for their society GMs. Um, you can look into that. Um, and that's the sanctioned Paizo Game League. They may have some sort of test or quiz that you could look into through them um, for knowledge. But I'm not sure. I haven't looked. I like we'll to absorb through doing. We'll quizzing you every session. Yeah. We'll ask you three questions. Legit, that would actually help me out with learning the rules so much better. Yeah. <laughs> we got Just you. Fire off questions as soon as you start. It no warning. It keeps me on my toes. It makes me study. <laughs> like, like... You hear that, Jason? Go work too, bud. <laughs> All right, Jason. You've been volunteered. You gotta quiz me. <laughs> every every single time I show up for a session, I gotta do a twenty question you, buddy. quiz. <laughs> it's for a great. Unfortunately, you have it. to prepare that as well. <laughs> yeah, because you're the only one who actually knows the rules. More work. <laughs> yeah, more work. We love you, dude. Characters are fun. Weird characters Char are always a blast to play, and I'm I'm excited to see what sort of uh, possibilities are available in Pathfinder. Like I've been I've been looking up for backup for Vesuviac just because I've learned that things be deadly. Just look at any of Corey's characters. <laughs> the but dice just like don't like me. It's fine. <laughs> But I've been looking at things like Investigator, um, Magus, 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 however the hell you say it. And, yeah, and I don't those, know either. Like Oracle, all of those seem to have such good uh, potential for just bizarre characters are really off the wall. Like, hello, my name is Charles and I am... I'm from a place long forgotten and I'm here to wield a sword of magic and nobody can stop me. And then I get killed the next session. <laughs> so, Let me... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I will save this. So I have this character that I created for my friend Brian's random games he used to run over in... I think they call themselves Time to Die Network now. Um, and my friend Brian used to run games over there like every... I think it was Friday. I'm not sure. But they were just called Dolby N. And they were one shots, so people could pop in and out at any point in time. He would just decide like how this game was gonna go. Like one day we did one that was <sighs> I can't remember the movie, but it's a very famous movie with Tom Cruise in it. Mission Impossible. I I don't know. There was a volleyball beach thing we did. Uh, we all had to play volleyball against an entire team of Tom Cruises, and then Godzilla came out of the ocean. I don't know, it was really weird. So we all made, like, the most chaotic characters possible for this. Like, one of them, I did a witch, and I made this witch going by homebrew rules that I found online for a guinea pig race. So she was literally a guinea pig that followed the party around, and she cast spells, she was a witch. That's not the character I want to tell you about. I made this character who, whose name is Lincoln Heronius. Yeah. He was a mute bard. Oh I made a mute bard, too. I've made a mute fighter. <laughs> Yay. Did they do interpretive dance? Mm -mm. He did. 
<laughs> oh no. Awesome. Lincoln Heronius, to communicate with other people, he would roll performance checks and he would essentially play charades with you so he could communicate with you. Yeah, he was he was quite the character, but he was basically Link. And when I would fight, I would do all of the yeah, what? and all that silly BS. He had a sword and an ocarina. But yeah, I, I have a I have a strong history of not making a single character that is normal. Robin, we gotta talk Zelda after this because God. <laughs> yeah, totally. Someday. <laughs> I. I'll play Baldur's Gate after this. Fuck yeah. A couple of uh, couple of characters I've played in the past. I've mentioned before that a lot of my experience prior to coming to Pathfinder originates from playing strange variety games: uh, Call of Cthulhu, Paranoia, um, Metal World, that kind of thing. I did that for a solid year before I finally found my first Pathfinder or D and D group. And amongst that, I played a character known simply as the Professor. He worked at the university. And if you asked him anything about that, he would say that he worked at the university and you could call him the Professor. I played the Professor for a solid six or seven months to the point where it was a Call of Cthulhu game where we ended up in Egypt working in essentially trafficking items and one thing led to another and the professor started having the ability to call contacts from universities that had no idea who he was but he worked at the university so he was valid enough to at least listen to in the end it call of cthulhu broke the professor's brain um, and I believe he was swallowed amongst a swarm of uh, Egyptian zombies. But not well before he had managed to convince the entire crew to throw their weapons into the Nile. Not before he had accidentally sold the relic that they needed to arms dealer. Or not an arms dealer, just a Bedouin trader. And not before he just failed every check he ever made to see what was happening around him. Do you guys have characters that have just been cursed from inception and never able to succeed? Has that ever seemingly happened to you? Yes. In the Tiamat game that I mentioned before where Belantio is from, he was my second character. <laughs> my first character was a half-orc named Agkor with three R's. And he was a half-orc barbarian that was... There were a lot of circumstances surrounding that that did contribute to him just absolutely sucking. This was for a D&D &D game that was recorded and was uh, put out on YouTube for a time. And so before we started recording it, before we started actually like doing the sessions... The GM came up to me and was like, hey, I want your character to be the leader. He was saying, like, of the group, he thought that I had, like, the strongest voice, that I had, like, the best strategy about me. Not sure how he came to that conclusion, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, he wants my character to be the leader of the party. So there was that pressure that kind of made me play him more as a, as like the straight man, as opposed to like just having fun with a rage filled barbarian. Like every single social encounter I went into was very no nonsense. But because of that approach, I ended up not being able to perform well because a barbarian in a social encounter trying to convince someone to do what they want doesn't always go well, especially when you have a sorcerer in the party, and a bard in the party as well. So there were... It, it just kind of was like he was trying to fill shoes that he couldn't quite fill, just based on my own comfort as a player at the time, because I hadn't even been playing D&D for a year by that point. So I was not very comfortable in that skin. 
every single time I rolled to like kill a monster, there was it, it became a running joke that uh, Agcor never got kills. He would hurt monsters like crazy, and everybody would always snipe a kill from him. And so that ultimately led to me approaching the GM and being like, "Hey." I really don't like the way that this character is going. I'm not having too much fun playing this character. I'd like to try something different. And so he got uh, killed by a wyvern, and then Belantio joined the party, and the leadership role fell to another character who was organically much more suited for it, and then I was able to have a blast in that campaign. But yeah, there, there have definitely been characters that just don't quite get to where I want them to be, where I just... I just don't have fun playing him. So, I think that's an interesting little foray. I think you've mentioned it before, Rachel, but Syl wasn't originally supposed to be the straight man mom of the group. Nope. Yeah, nope. I explicitly wrote Syl, or imagined Syl, as more mischievous and carefree and... I mean, we sat down, we introduced our characters, and I think it was mostly Sarah with Juan. It was just so silly. It's just like, I, you know, Juan is silly, Roden was silly, Rizzerk had his own little weirdness. He was quirky. Quirky, yeah. that's the word. So yeah, and then Syl just kind of fell into how they are. But I mean, I think that's how... I think we talked about this in character creation mutiny, but that's how most of my characters go, is I have an idea, I've thought about it, I've made backstory points, and then you start playing, and they just become who they're going to become, and you just, you know, get out of the way. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, Experience the natural one. progression of a character. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, and with Syl being the the surviving remaining character <laughs> of the original crew. This brings me to another topic we've kind of uh, alluded around a little bit more mm -hmm. serious. Let's talk about plot armor. How, how come Syl never gets knocked out? Because I'm an amazing player. No. Oh, is, is that what it is? <laughs> Burn oh, okay. attacks. Yeah, it, yeah. Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> so I'm great at risk. I'm bad at, I'm bad at Pathfinder, and yeah. I am okay with that because I still have fun. Yeah. I mean, Syl is naturally you know they play the mom of the group so to speak but they they're very much about self-preservation so if things are going down we've all seen it they just back up uh wait till the area of effect goes off and that is definitely not me like being just me like i play characters who get in the thick of things that's still being still so so with the new party composition with Vesuviak, Zaba, and Timothy. Hmm. Do you think that that position will... Sh do you think Syl's persona is going to shift and change a little bit? I would imagine so, especially with Syl's amnesia stuff happening that hopefully isn't a spoiler to anyone listening to this mutiny. Uh, like, their personality is naturally shifting since I'm trying to work that in as a natural... Thing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they definitely have to move up and give the flank to Zaba because the strategist and me just can't not do that. Um, <laughs> but it does put them in more of a risk. Um, but speaking to plot armor, I definitely had the moment when we started season two where I realized so was the only connection. And if they died in the last fight of season one, we would not have a connective tissue, uh, and it would be really weird. So that was mild pressure. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. We'll only yeah. see what happens to Syl. Hopefully, uh, they stay alive. You know, I do well, have uh, a backup, which is weird because I've never built a backup. I don't do oh, that. Oh, interesting. But I'm scared any, enough uh, for Syl. Any little teasers for what this backup may be? I'm using a ancestry from the battle zoo. Oh, Ooh. interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that would be, huh? Well, hopefully we'll never maybe find we'll out. Maybe we'll find out. Maybe no. we won't. Uh, maybe it'll come to light in something else down the road. I know that. Uh, mm -hmm. 
I know there's lots of aspirations of us doing Sky King's Tomb down the road, so mm -hmm. I hope you guys are dreaming of dwarves because mm -hmm. I'm ready. Yeah, um, I really hope. Do you I have get something to be built for that one. already? I haven't fully built anything out, but I have definitely already been starting to work on my character and who they are and what they do under the mountain and why they would be pushed towards this quest. But I also haven't looked very deeply into it. I just know what I know from first edition and the lore of the dwarves coming to Galarian. So a lot of it will likely have to shift and adapt for the changes that have come with 2E lore and depending on where they set the timeline for Sky King's Tomb. But I look forward to it. Uh, my home brood world had no dwarves in it. They were locked under a mountain and no party ever found the gate to release them and enter the dwarven metropolis that was thriving under a desert. But it was out there. It was just something weird and quirky, just like frost giants lived on the top of the mountains. Yeah. In terms of how plot. about? Yeah, I was gonna say, how about uh, yourselves? I clearly have no plot armor. My characters die. Even the ones that I really love um, get radiation sickness, and I roll five consecutive fails on rolls with a with aid and just can't pull out of that death spiral it happens so that's fine you just make something new but what about yourselves jackson robin have you ever encountered a, an instance where you've received plot armor or felt the need to give it to a player so i'm gonna be honest <laughs> as a gm it sucks to see your friend's character die because they're sad and like everybody at the table is sad and it's it's a very somber moment and it hurts a lot when it's unexpected so unless i have come to terms with a battle in advance like a boss fight being a real possibility that someone could die from it Generally, my characters have plot armor by default. <laughs> I, I need to break that habit. I know. I need to understand that death is a very fun part of Pathfinder and D and D and tabletop as a generality, and can definitely lead to great character moments. But I have, in the past, deliberately revoked plot armor from people or uh, have deliberately targeted certain players but it's always it's never out of malice it is typically because that player had approached me earlier and had been hey I don't like this character that I'm playing um, I'm not really having fun with how this is going like is there something that we could do to try and help this and I will give them the option of a reroll at the cost of their current character dying and if they agree to that, then the next session that character dies and their new character gets brought in. It's a hefty price. It is a hefty price, which is why I, which is why that is the price, because they have to consider that. I think only one time I have let a character that wanted to leave the party and bring in someone else actually not perish, but it was very much like they set down their sword and did not pick it up ever again. Uh, a very final, like, they are retiring. What? Can I ask, why is that your default instead of letting them retire? So, it's mainly because of the situations that we were in. The first time it happened, it was in a Legend of Zelda-themed campaign, and this was in a campaign where I had established very early on that Hyrule is a very dangerous place, and that the possibility of dismemberment and death was very, very real, um, to the point where there was a Kokiri druid that no longer has a leg because of a combat encounter they were in. And the person who had rolled a uh, Rito monk was really not liking it, wanted to go something somewhere completely different. I think they ended up being like a Kokiri cleric. And I viewed his not wanting to play that character anymore because I asked him if he did want something to happen with them. It's like, you could kill him off and that's fine. 
Um, so the character, the player already didn't care about that character or where they went. So I used it as an opportunity to introduce a villain. And the villain killed their character outright, left, and then they ended up finding a Kokiri druid to fill up that part of the party that they lost. And then the other time, we were in the Underdark. <laughs> so not really an option to retire while you're in the Underdark and trying to go to the surface. <laughs> That's fair. I've played in a few games where the opportunity to have a character walk away from the party and then later come up has arisen. And it's been always interesting to see what's happened to that character in the two months or however long they've been away from the party um, and what changes they've made. But a level of lethality isn't always such a bad thing. I don't mind characters dying. I like the interesting character moments and climaxes and uh, emotions that can be displayed through a character death because they're important. The life of, of an adventurer is hard um, and I don't think enough people talk about how getting up every day and fighting goblins and diving into tombs and stuff is going to take a toll on a person over time and uh that shift in persona and personality is interesting to try and take into consideration. As for plot armor, any thoughts, Robin? I've had plot armor once. And it was because another character made a terrible choice and I essentially sacrificed my character in efforts to save them. So, I don't know if you've ever played any World of Darkness games, but I was playing Werewolf Wild West, and I was playing a Black Fury, which is essentially, in Werewolf, a... She was a Black Fury Arun, which, in Werewolf, the Arun part is what moon you're born under. So she was a fighter. And the Black Furies are, like, an entire tribe of werewolves that are very specifically very feminist. They are like fanatical fin feminists. Um, like Amazons, essentially, you know? So they're very women empowerment and women are more superior and stuff like that. And my Black Fury had a a male I'm trying to remember what they're called. Familiar, essentially. You can take humans as familiars. And as... You don't really control them as you would an animal familiar. Uh, somebody can play your familiar. And essentially what they are is just a human that is unbothered by, you know, your undergoing changes. Because there are different forms you can take when you transform into your werewolf forms. You can transform into a wolf. You can transform essentially into a dire wolf. Uh, you can transform into a humanoid wolf monster. And then you can transform into like a humanoid with wolfish features or just be human. And my Black Fury's familiar, essentially, her human familiar, who was played by another player in our party, he was attacked and was going to die because of his own hubris and when my character went down his character went into a frenzy and tried to save me failed a role and then I had to try to save him back and it was a whole weird fanatical thing but instead of him failing his character was like awakening as a mage and instead of his character failing and killing me, his character essentially took my ailments into himself. And that way his character didn't kill mine by accident. So my DM kind of gave me plot armor with that because my character should have died as a crit fail on healing checks. <laughs> He should have accidentally killed me, but I was super into that character and I was super upset by the situation. We had really bad luck. He made some bad choices and some really bad roles. And uh, 
he took my critical condition, to which I had to then find a way to save his life. <laughs> but so yeah, that's the only thing time led to another. Yeah, that's the only time I've had plot armor, and it was during one of the wildest games I've ever, th I think I've ever played in. I've given characters plot armor once also. It was a bunch of newer players. I was trying to run a game for my friends. They found this wizard in a place they weren't supposed to be yet, but they were very determined to get there and chose to go there anyway. This wizard... Is... He was going to kill them. And one of my players decided to use fire spells, setting the entire mansion on fire, killing the bad, the big bad, but also themselves. So I, I did take and give them a powerful NPC who wasn't powerful at the time of creation, but they shielded them from the blast. And I was like, okay, due to the nature of this, I'm not going to make you all roll new characters for a total party wipe at like our fourth session. <laughs> so what I did is I, their NPC that they found and rescued who was following them through the mansion and leading them places and had tried to derail them from going into the places they were trying to get to, essentially shielded them from a god. <laughs> Uh, but that's the only things. time I really did it. Yeah, you know, I just... I I felt really bad. Some of them were very new players. Including, I think Josh was playing with us. I can't remember. Like, I just didn't want to be that DM that's just like, Yeah, we've played like three sessions so far. Total party wipe. This sucks. All of you make new characters. Like, I don't know. I just... I wanted to scare them, though. So I think they there's a right time and a wrong time to yeah. wipe them. It's that old proverb of knock them all unconscious and then have them wake up in a back alley naked. Yeah, yeah, essentially they were shielded and protected, but I did convince them all that everything was gone and that they might have died first. It was sort of a lesson I was trying to teach them, like, hey, you know, if things are very overpowered and very difficult here, forcing your way in is probably just not the best option. Sometimes you have to go get stronger and then come back. We've all played Fuck video games. Find out. Yeah, we've all played video games. We all know what happens when you go places you're not supposed to. You need to go grind a little bit. <laughs> I've, I've been in a session with one party like before. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Those, it's rough. Those are, those are brutal. That was I, just, I felt so bad. I didn't want... Dragons. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't think, want the first experience. I think those for some early sessions for new players are are important to nurture the fun aspect and uh, yeah. forego the lethality to a yeah. degree. It's there's nothing wrong in knocking one of them unconscious, but standing there and uh, hitting them twice once they're on the ground might be a little unnecessary. Yeah. I also What's your take, Rachel? You've run for a lot of people. You've run for kids. You've I've run, run for, for kids. Yeah. I definitely agree. I think it's a bad mindset to get into as a GM that your job is to kill people since that's really not your job. Your job is to let your players facilitate have a fun a story. time. Yeah. Yeah. Facilitate a story. Make sure your players are having fun. And if you can threaten them with, you know, if they're convinced that they can die, you normally don't have to kill them. Uh, yeah. I, I don't remember it, but I've been told I've killed a lot of players. I I don't remember it. It was a long time ago. <laughs> They're numb to it. Tell. <laughs> yeah. But, I yeah, I think normally if you can threaten to kill them and not actually kill them, that usually does the job, especially to teach them a lesson. You know, like you're saying, my group that Jason's in decided to go down a level in a traditional dungeon, which we all know, hopefully, every level of a dungeon is one level more difficult of creatures. So, they almost all died. Uh, but oops. Oops. Yeah, they did not do it again, so no. lesson learned. No, they, yeah. they, they finished the level they were on, leveled up, and yeah. then continued. Yeah, yeah. The way that those traditional dungeons are designed. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, I think the moral of the story is make characters that are fun and weird and dynamic. It's not going to hurt you to enjoy what you're doing. Just don't yeah. hinder other people at the table. Plot True. armor isn't plot armor if you're just facilitating a good time. Don't protect singular characters out of individual above table reasoning, but protect them and guide them as you wish would to onto yourself. And yeah, I think, uh, I think that kind of covers the moral of the story. Any, any counterpoints, <laughs> anyone? <laughs> no, <laughs> I like yours. <laughs> and any final remarks or thoughts before we wrap this up? The goal of the game is to have fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a game. Why are you so mad? Why you have to be mad? It's only game. Yeah. Oh look, that game's made me mad too. I can't. I can't argue. I can't. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you're just having a bad time. It happens. Sometimes, Sometimes you get locked in a, a, the, a 56 round combat and there's no escaping it. The dice gods speak. I'm triggered. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, once again, thank you to Robin from the Roaring Trainers for joining us. And everybody, have yourselves a good night and may have your party. Have a Pokeball. Oh, have a Pokeball or. May your party never end. <laughs>